To kind of raise that bar. Uh, that extra gear, the first three steps. Huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear, and today we uh, have the pleasure of sitting with uh, Ben Eves. And uh, Ben, obviously, we got to know each other just a little bit in the last kind of couple of weeks through some acquaintances at uh, at the Ice Hockey Systems where, where, where you're working and helping out with right now, which is uh, a really, really cool spot for any of you hockey enthusiasts out there that want to check out some good drills and some great skill, uh, some skill clips, some good coaching clips and things like that. A great resource for any coach or parent looking to kind of get a bit of an edge on the competition, I guess. Uh, but Ben, you've got a, a, a really, really cool hockey story. And uh, the biggest, I'll, I'll tell you, the biggest part of your hockey story that, that really hits home with me is is uh, is being maybe a bit of an undersized player at the time and, and going out and playing and getting some good years of hockey in you and, and obviously making hockey a career now that you're done uh, playing and kind of retired. Um, so first of all, if, you know, someone came up to you on the street, where's where's home for you? I know you probably have a lot of different homes over the years, but where uh, we're, we're kind of born and raised and kind of did, uh, did Ben Eve start out? Yeah, you know, I guess uh, we've moved, you know, probably up 15, 20 times, you know, since we kind of started this. But uh, I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota. My dad was playing for the Minnesota North Stars at the time. Uh, my brother was born a couple years later in Calgary, Alberta, when my dad got traded up to the Flames. And so um, just with being uh, a hockey family, first his dad playing and then dad coaching, we were on the road a bunch, just kind of the new new jobs, new opportunities across the country and across the world. But um, when we still stay home, we consider that Minneapolis and the Minnesota area. But the truth is, it, it, the game of hockey feels more like home because people are just kind of sprinkled all over the country. And wherever whatever city you're in, you know a couple people and you're able to catch up. And uh, so when people say that, really the game is home for us. Yeah, oh, well, for sure. Um, now, did your brother get dual citizenship, being Canadian and U.S. when he was born in Canada? We both had. Oh, nice. I don't know how my mom finagled nice. that, but uh, you know, I think Patrick had a choice uh, come World Junior yeah, time to, sure. you know, which team he was going to try out for, and uh, he, you know, wanted to do it for the American team, and so that was it. Actually, had to come into play, but uh, yeah, we both have dual, and again, I don't even truly know how that works, but. My mom is very proud of that, and uh, we saw a lot of family up uh, north of the border. That's a smart move by your mom and dad right there, though. That's a, I, that, that's a good one. <laughs> it's all my mom. It's not my dad. Yeah, it's all my mom, for sure. Yeah, uh, so. that's great. Now, for you, I guess as a youngster, obviously, you know, you kind of probably had to play hockey as far as you're, you're at the rinks, probably a bit of a rink rat when you were young. Um, but moving around like that, how was it for you in minor hockey? Because I know, you know, most most kids, you know, most young kids get a chance to play in their hometown or wherever they're living and, you know, spend you know their life there and play minor hockey there. But for you moving around, was it, all, was it weird kind of jumping from association to association or, you know, kind of at what age did you get into it and how did that work when you guys were traveling a lot as far as your dad coaching and moving around a little bit? Yeah. You know, we just grew up around the hockey rinks and locker rooms where we thought that was normal just to go and, uh, you know, run around and ride the Zamboni and go on the ice after practice was done with, you know, the professional guys, we just kind of, that was how we grew up. And, um, it was also how we made friends too. Whenever we went to a new city, you, you leave your friends behind as a kid. And that's, you know, a pretty, uh, traumatic thing every year, especially when you're younger, but, uh, the game allowed us to have a new friend group every year. And, um, and a lot of things came a little more natural to us, you know, looking back. And so, when you're one of the better players on your team, people, you know, gravitate towards you more. And um, so, again, the, the game's been good to us. It kind of gave us uh, a purpose and, you know, kind of a, an outlet whenever we were moving around places. And it also made our family pretty close where, you know, you're the new kid every year and you don't have any friends at school. So me and my brother, uh, you know, we're, my mom would still say we're best friends, which we are. We still talk every day. And, we just kind of survive together and uh, and just hope things are going to get better. And usually they did, which is nice. Yeah, no, that's good. That That's one thing about hockey, even at the ages that we're at now is, uh, well, I'm an older folk. We'll call you kind of middle, not so old as, not not, not as old as I am. But even, you know, if, if I ever moved somewhere, one of the first things that you're going to do is try to find a pickup game or meet somebody that, hey, I got a men's league team, you want to come play? And then all of a sudden you got... 10 buddies or 15 guys that you kind of know or have beers with, right? And same thing with minor hockey, you get jumped into a sports team. Well, 
you know, you're going to get to know a bunch of the kids right away. And and like you said, if you're good at the sport, then all, you know, everyone wants you on their team. They want to hang out with you. They want to, you know, um, and it sounds like you got, you and your brother, especially were probably doing skill development way before skill development was a thing. Meaning you guys had extra ice. You guys were probably working on your shot and doing different things like, you know, at the rink that you were able to do that a lot of kids didn't have an opportunity to do, which obviously enhanced your skills definitely over those, over those years. It, it did, and you don't know it when it's happening at the time. But you look back, and we just we, we just go to practice and we would watch, and we were at most games, and then you'd cut off your mini sticks and your playing stuff. And my dad was so great about it. Looking back, like everything was a game. Everything was, uh, you know, it was fun. It was a challenge. It was an obstacle course, and so we were working on things and developing, you know, skill sets that we would later use. And we were just having the time of our life, spending time with dad and all, all of his players. And so um, we were just so grateful looking back that it was the game was never pushed. The only thing that we had to do was work our hardest uh, and have fun. And there were a couple of times that we didn't work our hardest. Uh, you know, you thought the, the earth was going to you know <laughs> crumble and uh, the heavens were going to open up and everything was going to fall apart. But other than that, there was no pressure to play, to perform. It was just make sure you go out, you're the hardest worker, have as much fun as you can, and just enjoy the game. And so I, I'm i so thankful for that looking back, and I know my brother Patrick feels the same way in his hockey career as well. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, it's it, it's amazing. It's, it's uh, I mean, even what, like with what you do now, I know, I know currently you don't have children, but when you do, like, for what, you have access to IEC, you have access to skill development stuff. So even if you had a young boy or girl that likes the sport, whether they play or not, doesn't matter, but just going out and being able to have some fun on the ice and have some fun on the rink is, uh, is great. And I'm sure for your dad, and I'm saying this as a bit of a crazy father here, but for your dad having two young boys that were two years apart, they were athletic, you know, even set up these obstacle courses and stuff. He was probably thinking, man, these, these kids are actually getting pretty good and kind of enjoying that a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a little pride in that oh, as a father sure. when, you know, you're a kid. And unfortunately, it was my brother in a lot of things. He could pick things up so quickly. Like even when he's a kid to see him hit a golf ball or, or hit a ping pong ball or a tennis ball, it was like it was a natural thing. And I think that's why he's been able to score goals in the National Hockey League because he has this release that, you talk to guys across the league and it's like, that's big time, man. But, yeah. And uh, he could always do that. So I had to play catch up in a lot of those things and he had to catch up in other ways, but yeah, it was fun. It, it was fun just to learn and to grow and experiment and be creative, but uh, always having fun. No, that's awesome. Man. And I, I, so I've got a younger brother who's a year, year younger than I am kind of similar to you. I think cause Pat Patrick's a couple years, young, two years younger than you, I think. Um, and I, I would, and I don't know if you ever felt this, but I would get so frustrated because I didn't have the talent my brother had. I worked my tail off to, to become a skater or a shooter. And he, same thing, pick up a snowboard. He could snowboard, pick up a set of skates. Like I remember first time on the ice, I started late. I started when I was nine. He was eight. First time on the ice, you know, we'd skated before, but no, mom, I know how to do it. Dad, I know how to do it. Like, don't, don't teach me. I know how to do it. And first time on the ice, like on a full gear, he's off to the races skating. I could not do a full lap without falling like 15 times. And as an older brother, I'm losing it. Like in your mind, you're just like that little shit, you know, you want to, you know, um, but I think at, at some, it also pushed me a lot because I was the older brother. I wanted to be better than him, you know, so it kind of pushed me a little bit, but um, there's definitely some frustrating internal moments in my mind where I was like, what is going on here? I'm, I'm older. I'm, I should be better than him, you know? Oh, I, I had those as a, I think, yeah, <laughs> when I was younger, it, it bothers you, it stings, but, but then, yeah, it forces you to be better too, you know, once you get over that pride, and I'm very happy that he was so talented in certain <laughs> things, because it forced me to get better, I didn't have a choice, my pride would have been just shattered. Yeah, so, yeah, totally. Uh, we were chasing each other a little bit, which is fun. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then, kind of moving forward, obviously played minor hockey, probably all over the place, like probably all over the country. Um, and then once you got older, getting into kind of junior hockey and stuff like that, did you, were you looking at kind of college the whole time being, you know, I think a lot of times in Canada, we get OHL eyes, I call it. Everyone wants to play in the OHL. I lived in Sudbury, the Sudbury Wolves, and now I'm in London, the London Knights, and everyone wants to play junior. But in, in, in the States, it, it, I think it's a bit of a different mentality at times where a lot of the young kids want to play for Michigan or want to play for Boston college or Boston, you know what I mean? Like, uh, was that kind of what it was like for you guys? And I know your father had a bit of a college background. So was he kind of pushing NCAA or wanted you guys to get an education out of it or try to go college route? Again, I think that comes back to my mom, like education was her top priority through all this. And if the game can help, you know, you get an education, that's fantastic. But 
we weren't going to slack off one for the other. And that was really important. And I, I think when that hit actually was my freshman year of high school, my, my dad got an opportunity to go coach over in Helsinki, Finland for uh, IFK. I think they're the big red cats or okay. everyone just refers to them as IFK or Keith Keith. Um, and uh, the general manager was Yarmo Kekalainen, who's now the Columbus Blue Jackets general manager. Yeah. So uh, our family moved over there and, and we lived there for a year and it was, it was an amazing experience. Uh, very difficult, but amazing from a hockey perspective, a life perspective. But that's when we realized that we wanted to go to college and staying in Finland and their, the public school system there doesn't match up with the NCAA guidelines. And so it actually kind of drove us to come back to uh, the States because we actually did have college dreams and aspirations and hockey wise, we could have stayed there and, and continued to develop and, you know, just learn different ways of playing the game, but we had to come back and actually uh, take care of the, the clearing house to have yeah, a chance yeah. to go and play college hockey. Yeah. Now so, was, yeah, so I was a freshman in high school. Yeah. Which is, which is kind of crazy, right? Like for your, like uh, I say crazy, not in a bad way, but crazy is in a, uh, your parents obviously, very confident in, in just picking up and moving because taking kids in high school to another country is like, that's, that's a pretty big move, you know, to, to do that, obviously. Now, when you were over there, did you notice, I know it's, you know, a couple years ago now, but did you notice a big difference in the way they were doing skill development over there or the way they were practicing and playing compared to the way we were doing it in North America? They, they were so far ahead. Yeah. Uh, and that was in the, in the mid nineties, just, I mean, the way they talked about the game, like, our, our our tactic talks we had, the way we trained, the way we went on the ice. It was just, it was nothing like I'd ever seen before. And, and I think the gap's gotten a lot smaller uh, just with the internet and with people going out and being able to talk and uh, share ideas. But back in the mid nineties, like it was, it, it was fantastic. And again, we were so lucky to just be a part of that. And, you know, just, again, I still use things and I still have friends that played on my team that played pro that are now coaching and managing. And we were very lucky to be with a really good group of boys and, and families. And, um, and it's just, yeah, it's just a very unique, uh, and again, I think it comes down to soccer a little bit where like the game is soccer is such a, such an old and rich game. And, and the way they talk about, you know, how they handle the ball, their first touch and, and the pace on a pass and just like things that I, you know, I was like, I was like the kid who just walked into a candy store and I hadn't tried, <laughs> you know, almost everything on the shelf. And I was like, geez, I'm pretty good at this game, but I don't know what you guys are talking about. And, um, so again, looking back on developments, like we were the luckiest kids in the world to go over and play a speed and skill game before that became normal for, for North America. And, I mean, even in the NHL in the last 15 years, the game has changed so much. Oh, for sure. And they're, they're playing more of a European game now. Totally. And uh, it's on a smaller ice sheet, but it's a European game. It's fast. Everyone has to play now. And, uh, yes, yeah, so we were able to experience that. And, and you just get the wheels turning right away. And uh, you're very fortunate to be in certain places, you know? Oh, man. Like, as a as a hockey guy or skills guy, like, kind of, you know, same as you, I love hearing that because – it's funny because I know in Canada specifically, I can't talk about the U S but I know in Canada, we, we were playing catch up on skill development because we were Canadian. We play for the flag. You just play cause it's your country. You know, it's not a business yet. Like especially 10 years ago and over the last couple of years, Canada's really developed or not developed, but taken a lot of the models from Finland and Sweden and, and move them over here, like cross ice hockey and, and small area games and all that stuff. You hear all these buzzwords now, but a lot of that stuff came from Europe where they were doing this. Like they weren't playing hockey games. They were working on skill development at young ages and skating and puck handling and free play. And, you know, and we were all structured and dump and chase at, at in, in, you know, when you're eight years old, like ridiculous, you know, and now it's starting to change, but you still have some old guards that are still old school here a little bit. And, but it is starting to change, but it's funny because you see Finland, such a small country or Sweden's a small country and they're, they're powerhouses at hockey. And, and a lot of other sports too, but I mean, we talk, we're talking hockey, but how good are some of these kids that are coming out of there right now in the NHL? And you mentioned it like the skill set in the NHL right now is, you know, off the charts and I can't see it getting any worse. You know, it's going to continue to get better and continue to get more, you know, creative, you know, as, as, as these youngsters keep coming up, right. Which is, it's crazy. It is. And again, I don't have as much experience in Sweden, but, um, but the Finns, I mean, they have their national Institute of sport in Viermaki, Finland, which is about, 45 minutes north of Helsinki. They have 
people come in from all over the world, different coaches, and they get like a PhD coaching in hockey. And it's, uh, I have a friend in the program right now, but it's a three year program. And by the end of it, you're going to be with some kind of pro or junior team there. And they have a whole system where they're developing coaches and they're, they're trying to see where the game is going in 10 years. And they're going to build their curriculum towards that. So not only can they have these world class coaches, but they want these guys to go down and work with their kids because they want to dominate the hockey world as a country of 5 million people. And, it's crazy. and they're going to keep on pushing it to, to make sure that they're at the forefront. And I think they've won, I don't know, it's the world juniors, the, the, the what world championships. And I don't know if they have the Olympic they right did. now, but like they're no, almost they did, at a yeah. golden age of yeah. like Finnish hockey right now. Yes. And, and we're all watching to see what they're doing. And it's not perfect, but like, man, you see them maximizing what they have. And, uh, and the World Championships last year was just a great example. Of, there was no NHL guys on that team, and but man, did they play together? They made plays. They yeah, they, like they deserved the medal. It was really special. I thought I couldn't have been more happier for them. I totally agree. Yeah, it's unreal, man. And they're. Uh, I spoke to uh, Oli Mata. Obviously, played for the London Knights. Um, played in Pittsburgh. Now he's in Chicago. Unreal guy. Work a workhorse. Like just a really, really and a good guy. Yeah. But I had, him on, I had him on the podcast about a year ago, and we just chatted and. The background for him was unreal. Like he just played sports. It wasn't like, you know, he wasn't picked up at seven years old and said, you're playing hockey. He was playing everything, all these other sports. And he didn't even know if he was going to really, you know, get into hockey. And then he ends up winning like world juniors and Olympics, like, you know, Stanley cup, like, and he's, but he's, he got focused into it as he got older, but it was just, it was fun. Like sports were fun, you know, and they had a good, like the, like you said, the curriculum there was based around sports and then you can go to sports schools and it's all tied into the education and, you know, we're just getting there now in Canada where we have like, you know, sports schools that are just part of the public system, which it, to me is crazy that we haven't had this earlier. Like, how do you not, like, know. even when we went to school, how could you not go to school and have a hockey class or have a, you know, it was mind blowing to me, but we're just finally starting to figure this stuff out and start to do it. So it's, uh, we are behind for sure, but hopefully, you know, over the next bunch of years, we'll be able to catch up and, and keep it going. It's been the crazy thing there is like, like everything's free. Like yeah. these sports schools, if you get selected, like, well, you have an hour and a half of a skill ice in the mornings, you go to class and you have your practice and your off ice training. And like, it's all very structured and they, again, they're kind of the model of socialism, but they do provide opportunities for everybody. If, if you're good enough, like we're going to support you through and through. And again, looking back at, at our, my journey, my brothers, you know, we, we were at Shattuck St. Mary's for the years before and after Finland and, we had keys to the rink and we would put the ice in every year with the Preezy brothers and That's through awesome. Stafford and, yeah. and just all these guys, like we were just all buddies and we just wanted to play hockey. And uh, so we were playing tennis or golf or whatever, but we just, we had access to almost like a Finland type setup. And we were the, again, the luckiest kids in the world and everyone went on and not everyone, but a lot of us went yeah. on and were able to, you know, college and pro. And it was the environment we were in. We had great people who cared about us, but we were in the, just incredible environment to be creative, to challenge each other, to, yeah. you know, you go up for a shinny game in the summer and like you're shaking. Cause it's like, that, their lineup's unbelievable. Like I can't go out and like, you know, fudge a pass or like, I'm just gonna <laughs> have to get off the ice, you know? <laughs> but again, you just look back. It's like, we're very fortunate and Shattuck provided that for us as kids. No, that's cool. I want to, I want to touch on that just quickly because right now for a lot of young players and parents right now, mine are hockey. Let's say you get into that band of age. So maybe 12, 13, 14, 15, they're starting to make decisions on, Oh, should I go to a prep school? Should I go to like a Shattuck or even there's a lot of them now in Ontario and, and across the U S right. Um, for you having that experience personally going to a, a kind of a, a, an unreal, you know, obviously a very well-known school in Shattuck St. Mary's, but what was it like for you when you went there? Like, did you, was it too much? Cause a lot of times parents are like, ah, oh, they're going to burn out. It's too much hockey. It's too much, you know, um, what was it like for you as far as doing it? I know you're, you're a young guy who loved hockey. Like I was like, I could eat hockey all day when I was young. Um, but yeah, what was that experience like for you? And, and, you know, how did it kind of help you get ready for that next stage in your career? I mean, I, I think the cool thing about a prep school, and again, our family, we, we lived in the dorms there. My mom was a dorm parent. My dad coached, but we didn't have like prep <laughs> school money to like go and like afford that. So that's a whole nother conversation in itself. You know, how, how do, if you can afford it, you know, the pros and cons, but 
Um, we went there for, for hockey because it was a place for my dad to coach. You know, he took a step back and it was a place for us as kids to have access to just to some, you know, the facilities and to be an environment where other kids want to be hockey players. And, um, but we, we didn't burn out because the school was there and we were, you know, doing tennis in the spring with our buddies and we're acting in the plays. And like we had this whole other prep school life. Um, where, you know, I have friends who are doctors and lawyers now all over the world. And, and yeah, a bunch of us went on and played pro and, a, you know, a whole bunch went and played in the NHL, which is just amazing. But, um, but no, we didn't burn out. It, it was the best years of our life. And you look back and living in the dorms with your best friends, getting locked in every night. And like, <laughs> it, it was just, you know, from start to finish, it's like, man, were we lucky, you know? And, yeah. um, even the coaches, you know, we had, uh, Brian Riley, who's at West Point now, uh, Andy Murray, yeah. who went to the LA Kings right after and St. Louis Blues, he was with us for a year. And then uh, Tom Ward, who's been there for a long time, has done a great job. And we, we had world-class people around us and they made it fun. It was hard. And we, we thought we were all going to play in the NHL. And a lot of the boys did, which is kind of crazy, but, um, best years of my life. Like I, I hope to do that for my kid one day because yeah. we just played. We just played. Oh, that's awesome. One thing though, I want to touch on with your parents, like obviously they made a lot of sacrifices throughout their life and your father was following his dream and coaching, but they had your best interest. I think a lot in a lot of these decisions I've just heard about, they had your best interest in a lot of these decisions that they made. Um, and one thing I really strongly suggest the parents to, to think about is you can make it work. So for instance, I, I wasn't from a family that had a lot of money. So, you know, we did, what we had, I had summer jobs, whatever it was. Right. But I think like for the, the story you just told, like, your dad took a step back from pro to coach, you know, at a prep school, which a lot of the pro coaches would have been like, what are you doing? This is crazy. But he did it for the family. You guys lived in a dorm, made some sacrifices there. No backyard. You know, you can have a dog with a nice white picket fence. Um, but I think, and we say this to parents all the time. I've had parents come up to me like, hey, I'm a photographer. I'd love, love my kid to come to your school. I can do some freelance stuff for you and help you promote your business. Well, that's worth a couple thousand dollars to me you know, or to whoever's prep school this is. So being creative as a parent too, I think there are other ways. We've had parents that have gone to local businesses in a small town that they're from and asked for a little bit of sponsorship money to help pay for prep school for their kid who's a really good player, you know, and they got a couple thousand dollars from local businesses just wanting to help out, you know. So there, there are ways to make stuff like that work because not everybody can afford 30, 40, you know, 15,000 to 45, 60,000 dollars. I get that, but there are ways to make it work if yeah. you really think about it, you know, so um, that's, yeah, that's, there is an, an investment too. like a, a, truly the investment, um, as a hockey player, as a person from an educational standpoint, like I, I can't even, I won't ever be able to put a price tag on what that was for me and my brother. And, um, yeah, just, yeah, I won't ever be able to do that. So I hope people can find ways and, uh, I'm going to have to find a way at some point too. I know that for sure. <laughs> but even like to your point, uh, you know, the connections, I mean, even from coach, your dad coaching, you guys playing, you have a lot of buddies and made a lot of connections, but even just from being at Shattuck, I'm sure you've got, you know, 10 people that you could pick the phone up right now and call and some are doctors, some are lawyers, some are playing in the NHL, some are retired, some are coaching somewhere. Like, you know, the, just those connections alone, how do you put a value on that when you need a, a favor, you need a signed Jersey from somebody for an asylum auction for a charity? Like those are things to me that you're right. That I, there's way bigger people think of prep school. Like, oh, you're crazy. You spend all this money on hockey. Like, no, it's a bigger picture to me. It's a big, it's putting them around some good people that care, that genuinely care about them. They want them to work hard. They want them to, and to me, when you put your kids in those kind of environments, whether they play pro or they end up going on or whatever, you're hopefully developing good people and they're going to be a good dad or a good mom, or they're going to be a good person. They're going to be a good friend. You know what I mean? Like, so I, yeah, I, I I'm all for it. I, I love it. And you know, similar to you, I'm not from a background where my parents could afford it, but if, you know, if my kid does love soccer, and he's eating soccer balls every day and he's just, that's all he wants to do. I will try to find a way, you know, to, to, to dig some holes for the uh, yeah. soccer post so I can get my kid in there and hopefully save some money. hundred <laughs> percent agree. hundred yeah. percent. Um, so then kind of following Shattuck, then you end up jumping into, uh, to basically you NCAA, right. And, and get a, now did you have a lot of schools yeah. that were, that were on you or that were talking to you and stuff like that? Or was it, uh, did you kind of have your mind made up on where uh, you love to go? You know, I, I, I did sample around, I, you know, you, I mean, in Maine, I think I went to Boston University, was looking at North Dakota. And so, yeah, so I, I was able to kind of look around a little bit and check some things out. But um, I always loved Boston whenever we went there to play tournaments. And the Bruins were awesome at the time yeah. in the 
late nineties there. And, and then I just went on campus and, and just met everybody and it was a good school and it just all fit together so well. And, um, again, another lucky, great decision. And, you know, we, we went in national championship my first year and, Amazing. uh, no one there with, with the boys. And it's just like, yeah, you just get really fortunate in some of the things you do. And again, our class, we still text each other every day. The, the six of us there who graduated together, yeah. awesome four years, Jerry York, you know, is, uh, just creating an environment and a culture and, uh, Again, you just, it's nice to even play for a lot of these different people and you learn from them and you see what things that you want to take as a coach or a skill development coach or just even how you want to interact with an athlete or deal with, you know, the myriad of different situations you're going to find yourself in. And uh, Coach Ark was just another great model for that. And uh, those four years were great. They, they flew by too fast, but it's a great year. Yeah, it is crazy how fast four years fly. Eh? With co- like, it's so busy, like with school and work and, uh, yeah, hockey obviously and workouts and all that kind of stuff. It's uh but man, it, it seems long sometimes when you're in the when you're in the trenches doing it, and then when you get out, you're like, oh man, I'd love like even when I I got an opportunity to play a little bit of professional hockey after, and and I remember when I was pl- I loved playing pro, it was fun, you had all this time on your hands, but I look back sometimes like, man, I wish I could go back to college. If there's one place I could go back to right now, yeah. it'd be college for sure. It was so fun. Hundred percent agree. Great bunch of guys. You're, you know, it's it's and the class that you go in with, you know, within a one or two years, you're going to be with those guys for two, three, four years, which is amazing because that doesn't happen a lot in hockey, whether it's junior, prep, pro, like that doesn't happen. So getting a chance to stick with those same guys for a little bit of time is uh, is really cool for sure. Um, yeah, very fortunate. No oh, question. Yeah, it's amazing, man. Um, I was going to ask you this earlier and I, I kind of skipped over it, but when you were kind of backtracking quickly, but when you were, um, young and get, jumping on the ice when your dad was coaching and stuff like that, he obviously coached at a very high level. Uh, were there any players that maybe stick out in your mind that stayed on the ice of the after practice and messed around? I know this happens all the time because I've been around, you know, with, with uh, with some pro teams now and you see like the little, you know, little Brad's little kid coming out and then a couple guys, especially the young kids, right? Like you got a 19, 20 year old pro guy who's basically a kid. So he's out there playing with them. But was there anybody that stuck out to you like that, that, that you remember over the years that were, that would always, not always, but stay out with you and play games with you and play one-on-one and just mess around with you at all? Yeah. Yeah. We, we were in high school uh, at Shattuck there and my, my dad got offered a job to coach with the Penguins in the late nineties. So, he actually was out in Pittsburgh. Our family stayed at Shattuck, but we'd go on our breaks and we'd go and visit him. And uh, Lemieux just retired and Yager was kind of in his heyday there, you know, putting up, you know, hundreds Sick. of points. And, yeah. Um, but there was a couple of guys, Tyler Wright and Ian Moran, were two of the, the nicest, best, like funnest guys. Uh, they were so good to us, like around the locker room, took care of us. But, and, and again, no disrespect to them, but Alexei Kovalev used to stay out with me and my brother and just used to do stick handling stuff, yeah. keep away games, like show us like little tricks. And he's arguably one of the most talented oh, players ever to, to play the game. And yeah. he's, you know, you don't realize it, but he's, he's six foot two. He's 215 pounds. He's this massive man. He uses a stick that comes like almost up to his belly button, this <laughs> little thing <laughs> with this big, like just banana peel for a curve. And <laughs> the stuff he would show us and the sauce he would put on and like, but he just wanted to play. He was so he was so nice to us, and so we couldn't wait for uh, you know Kobe to stay out after practice Definitely. and just uh, just remember the keep away games. And he was doing stuff that he did in games, but he's doing it against two high school kids, and we <laughs> were just trying not to run into him and hurt him, you know. Yeah. But uh, I'll always remember that. Right? We, me and my brother still talk how cool that was. Like we were again so fortunate to. Uh, be around really, really good hockey people. That's unreal, man. What was it like, you know, being a high school kid going in, your dad gets a job, you guys go in maybe for one of your first or second or third visit down there. What was it like to see Lemieux? Because, I mean, growing up, you see Gretzky, you see Lemieux, you see the, you know, the goals and all the stuff, and then actually being able to see him in person as a youngster. Maybe you met him before, but was it kind of like, was it a bit like jaw-dropping or was it uh, a little surreal or how was it? You know, it was, I think we just saw him from a distance. Like, he had re- he had retired, he... I think he owned the team at that point or was part owner. So like we never actually okay. got to go up and I don't remember shaking his hand. Like I, I, I met him later when, yeah. uh, like during training camp in 05 with Pittsburgh. But, right. uh, but like he was there, he's just like this figure, you know, like this, <laughs> again, he's, he's a massive man and, yeah. uh, just has this presence about him. And, um, I think I'm sure the coaches were trying to get him to come out of retirement to come and play for them again there. 
<laughs> when, uh, when my dad was, you know, the coaching, but, but yeah, I remember seeing him from a distance and I didn't know how big he was until I saw him. And, you know, as a kid, you just kind of, even as a pro, when I was, you know, you just kind of, you're looking at him like, Oh, that's Mario. Totally. You know? Holy smokes. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, again, it's all surreal when you're a kid and you, you're trying to process stuff you can't even really process. Yeah. And what was Yags like? Did Yags have the big, like the nice hair going at that point when you, uh, when you saw, oh, yeah, yeah. He awesome. had the curls. Awesome. Yeah. He, uh, I think he's experimenting with like the yellow toques at the time on okay. his, like, uh, on his skates. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah he yeah. had about 12 yeah. to 14 pairs of skates in his locker and like, really? he was so meticulous about them. He'd go off to practice. Even in the middle of a game, he'd go off and like get a new pair of skates on. He just, He's so meticulous about him, but he had, he had the hair down to here and yeah. he used to touch his stick and, you know, just kind of see what he was working with, you know, and totally. uh, they were out of practice and just to, again, just to touch it, be around it. You just, uh, you just eating it all up at the time. It's unreal, man. No, it's so cool. That's what that, that, that's one thing I love doing is going through a stick rack of pro players and just to see what they're using, what their knobs look like, what the, you know, what oh, flex yeah. they're using. Oh, yeah how tall they are, how short they are. Cause a guy like Kovalev, he didn't, he had a great shot, but it wasn't a cannon, but he could stick handling. And that was his game. Right. It's like, a, and cause that's a, that's a question I'm sure that comes up with you with young kids. A lot is like, how long should my stick be? And I mean, obviously you would like to stick with some length so you can, you know, shoot and stuff. But like you look at Crosby short stick, you look at other players, it cast a long stick. So it depends if you're a shooter, if you're a handler, if you're a passer, like how you play is going to dictate where that stick sure. length should be. Right. So it's hard to give a perfect answer. Um, but yeah, being able to like check those sticks out is un- unbelievable for sure. Yeah. 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 Everyone's got their own kind of special wand. And it, for me, I, it's fun to just talk to kids about, you know, what they feel or like, you know, what is your game? Do you need a big paddle? Are you tipping shots in front of the net or, you know, are you milking to use, are you a long guy who likes a little stick so you can push your puck and get around guys? Like, yeah, like have the stick complement who you are as a player and, but it's fun because they have to find that out because, you know, we used to do the old up to the nose, you know, yeah. and then, yeah, I think cut it at the nose. And then once <laughs> you get your skates on, it's at your mouth. And it's like, that's a starting point, but that's just the start. Now we got to play with this a little totally. bit, which is fun. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, yeah, no, it's, it, there's, there's so many little intricacies, right? And it's hard when you're young, well, especially for young parents that are getting into the game it's hard to know all this stuff, right? So it's, it, it is, it is important to get around some good, hopefully coaches or good hockey people in your community that can help you figure this stuff out. And like you said, there's going to be a starting point and then your son or daughter is going to figure it out as they go. And they may like this or may like that, or maybe their shot's terrible. And you look at it, well, your stick's too short. You got to lengthen your stick a little bit or your stick's way too long, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of little in- in- intricacies that go into that stuff for sure. Um, and, and I they, actually, not to be no, a dead get, horse, but, uh, I was at the rink uh, with the Cleveland Monsters the other day. And Nathan Gerby, uh, he's an old friend from Boston College, and he's the captain. And um, he's coming. He's rehabbing an injury right now. He's trying to get ready for what he thinks are going to be the end of the season, the playoffs this year. Yeah. Uh, hopefully in June or July. But he had ten sticks in his like in his rack, and I was like, "The like, Gerbs, I was like, what are you doing? Are you like the worst like sawman in the league? Because <laughs> they're all different sizes. Yeah. Like ones, you know, here, ones there." And he's like. He's like, it depends on the day. Like, I don't know which size stick I want to use when I go out on the ice. So I'll bring four of them out, and, like, each day it's a little different. I never heard anyone say that before. No way, me neither. He's like, he's like, sometimes, like, my back feels off, and I can't bend down as much, or sometimes the puck, I'm losing pucks in my feet. And so so he has 10 sticks, and not one of them is the same length. No way. And I've never seen that before. No. So, again, he just learns stuff all the time. Yeah. And, he could stick handle in a phone booth and yeah, uh, still skilled, get out man. of it. So how how tall? Yeah, is he? I, I'm always interested. How, how tall? Gerbs is God. He, he's not more than five five. Yeah, like I'll, I'll say five five, but uh, yeah, nothing he can more play, than that. Though, for man. Sure. He's, he's good. Like yeah, you're like he's skilled, yeah. man. Yeah, and he's put together like a little yeah. pit bull, and like he's just you know he's always on his toes. He's always like ready to like. Uh, it's just funny. He's a, he's a good friend and just the, the ultimate pro. Like he, yeah. he gets it done, man. Oh, that's awesome. Now uh, talking about size a little bit here, but you know, for you get out of going out of college to pro, I mean, this is before the rule change. Cause I think the rule change happened in 05, as far as like no more clutching and grabbing. And, and I'm an undersized player as well that played in, um, I loved college. Like I, I absolutely loved playing college. It was a lot of fun. What I hated about college was that it really, there was no separation between the the tough players and the fake tough players because everyone was tough. You had a cage on, couldn't fight. It was so you had a lot of like cheap stuff and just you know 
were pro like that got negated like it was out of the question because now you could punch a guy in the face if you wanted to and it changed you know the game but it was also for i know for me and i'm sure for you you know guys grabbing the back of your pants and that was okay guys can opening you if you know what a can opener is basically they put their stick between your legs and they turn you into a pretzel um and i remember the first time it happened to me on a russian pro coming down the wing and think i'm gonna get around a guy and next thing you know i'm in the corner with my glove in my mouth and my other glove behind my back I'm like what just happened you know um, but for you coming out of college, what was it like, you know, kind of being a, a skilled guy, obviously, and putting up numbers in college? How did you find the pro game from college when you uh, when you made that transition? You know, I, I played in the lockout year while they were figuring out those rules. So I played one year with the old rules. Okay. And I, remember, I remember calling up my dad. I had a couple of knee surgeries after that year, and so I didn't start playing until around Christmas time. But in that new year, I remember calling up my dad. I was like, Dad, like, I'm not going to be able to play much longer, like, I think I'd lost half a step with my knee injuries and like the guys are so big that they just, they just bear <laughs> hug me. Like we used to call them backpacks because like these guys used to be 220, 230, couldn't skate. But if they got their stick into your side, they pull you in and they would bear hug you. Like, God, like I, I can't get away from these guys. Like, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to play here anymore. Then the next year, obviously they changed the rules and, and then they couldn't touch anymore. And it was like the Amazing, greatest thing in the right? world yeah. where it was like, it was like, they can't, they can't slash you in front of the net. They can't cross check you. They can't Dad, like, I'm going to be able to play for a long time now. I think, <laughs> you know, and it, it just totally reversed because I wasn't as explosive as Gerby. I didn't have the size to be able to get away from that. And I was like in between, but as soon as they changed the rules, I was like, Oh, this is, this is my game, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it hel- it helps a player like me for sure. No, oh, definitely, man. Because I think that was a, a so I the year of the lockout in 05, I may have mentioned this before, but that's kind of that's when I stopped playing. And it was more just because we bought a business and I was doing that. I had an opportunity to go back and play in the East Coast League if I wanted to, and I was him and Han, and I didn't. And I wish I had because I still love the game. But I got to a point and, and maybe you did too, where I I was like, hey, how many more video games can I play in the afternoon? How many more lunches can I go? Like maybe I should use my degree, maybe I should move and it was probably me trying to be a little bit more mature than I should have at the time. I should have said, ah, oh, screw it and keep playing for another couple of years. But it, it was what it was. So then when I saw, started watching games with the new rules, I'm like, oh, and I was not like a crazy skill guy. So it wasn't like I was going to be making guys look silly and go to the net and bury. But I was like, man, I, I could skate. So I was like, oh, wow, this would have been fun to just not get, you know, not get tangled up with guys all the time and get bear hugged, like you said, you know. Um, so when 105, when those rules changed for you, like you said, that must have just been, kind of like the, the, the sea parting a little bit, like, okay, my, like, this is okay, here we go. Like now I can, I can wheel, I can get some space and, and a little bit of time to make plays, you know? Um, and then when you yeah. kind of got into playing in the AHL and stuff and, and, and at, at the beginning, was it a, was it a big adjustment from college that you find as far as like speed and the quickness of passes and shots and things like that? Did you notice a big adjustment or was it just more the smarts of the game and the positioning of the game and how guys played it? For me, I, the one thing I noticed right away was just one, how big the guys were. Like, like there was a, like a size speed difference that just across the board, guys were, guys were big. Um, and they could shoot the puck. Like I could never really shoot the puck that well. And, yeah. um, I mean, like it was, yeah, it was not pretty. I had to work on it, change my stick, my flex. Cause like it was embarrassing because <laughs> these guys could all just hammer the puck from anywhere. And it was just like, I, I that's not cool. I don't have that right now. So those two things jumped out, but it was the position. It was the smarts. It was, I remember going on a one-on-one in practice against our captain, who Elaine Nazardine, who's the yeah. interim head coach for the devils yes, now. Yes. And, and Naz, Naz was meat and potatoes, like, like tough, hardworking, honest, but like Naz didn't do anything great. He was just an unbelievable leader and yeah. competitor. But, but I remember going on one-on-one against him in, I couldn't get the blue line on him. And I was like, I was like, Naz, what are you doing? Like, you're not a great skater. You're not like, <laughs> yeah. but I, I literally can't even gain the blue line. And that's never happened to me before. And then just guys were so smart. They knew angles. They knew how to, yeah. you know, if I take away this, this is your only space. And now my stick's going to be here. And now all of a sudden I squeezed you right where I want you. You got nothing. And I was just blown away by some of the, just the old school smarts of these guys. And yeah. And, uh, again, then you start to learn their tricks and then, then it starts to unravel a little bit. But as a rookie going in, it was like, like these guys, like they make me look silly. And like, I'm not used to like being like, look like this, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you learn lessons and they teach you and they laugh at you and, yeah. uh, just a great experience. But it was the position, the smarts that, uh, 
and the structure of it that I thought was uh, a huge jump. Yeah. When I, uh, when I jumped into to pro, I, what I found, I it was in my last year of college. I ended up leaving pro, leaving college for a couple of weeks and went and played down and like, finish up a season, right? Yeah. Just try it out. And I found my first pro game. I jumped in, went from full cage to zero cage, which like, I don't know why I'm 5A. Why would you go with no cage or no visor, but whatever. This was awesome, right? But it was amazing how uh, I found the game simpler. Like it was just, if I was on the wall as a winger, the puck, they knew I was there. If I was in the middle as a centerman, I was swinging low. And there was everything, guys were where they were supposed to be a lot of times. Where in college, I love yeah. college, but I, I kind of relate college to horse racing. Like you open the gate and it's just four lines of guys flying. Now your top end guys are skilled and they make plays, but your third and fourth line, like, come on. You're going out and you're just banging, and crashing and you know, skating as hard as you can, as fast as you can. It's such a fast game. So I found in pro, it was still quick and fast, but it was like more structured and guys knew where they were a little bit more. Yeah. So was, I enjoyed it more. It was more fun to play. Um, and uh, it was it was a definitely a learning experience. Just like you said, like learning the tricks and like how to get to the net or how to get a puck through a guy. Like, you know, they like they show you a triangle and that triangle will be gone in a second, stick or block the pass or going the other way. And you're like, man, that, that always worked in college. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to drop that yeah. line, right? I used to be really good at yeah. face-offs in college. Uh, buddy, this isn't college anymore. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> No, you, you you respect what the pro guys do, what they know, and and again, they, like they play eighty, you know, eighty two games a year. Like it's not two games every weekend where it is true, like yeah. a horse race where they're yeah. just they're in the stalls for five days, button heads, and we finally get to see somebody like <laughs> at the pro game. They just have to be efficient with everything and their spacing and just just their energy more than anything. So it, it was an adjustment, but I, I did like that about the pro game too. Oh, that's awesome, man. Um, and then I guess kind of going through pro and then kind of, you know, when you were kind of coming to the end a little bit, as far as, you know, maybe realizing, ah, you know what, I don't, I don't, maybe I'll play for another year. Maybe I won't. And maybe some other opportunities came up, but how did that go for you as far as getting out of hockey and kind of realizing, you know what, I think I'm going to, you know, w- was it kind of your decision or was it an injury or was it maybe writing was on the wall or was it, ah, I want to get into something else and kind of flip the page. You know, I was, it was either 29 or 30. Um, I was going back to play for Yokerith. Uh, they were in the Finnish league and they were transitioning into the, the KHL or I guess it's the KHL. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The following year in the Russian league. And, uh, I still thought I, I had a chance to play in the NHL and it was the greatest thing in the world. Cause I, uh, I was centering, uh, Teobo Teravainen who's with the hurricane. Yeah. And I, I was, I was telling everyone before it all happened. I was like, this kid's the Finnish Patrick Kane. Like yeah. he's unbelievable. Like, the fact that I get to play with this kid is amazing. Yeah. And then on the right wing was a, a good friend of mine, Stevie Moses, who uh, is a goal scorer. And I sat him down and said, boys, he's like, you guys are getting me into the NHL. Like, we're going to have a great year. <laughs> like, I'm going to sign going back. Like, I still yeah, had yeah, that. And like, sure. in my mind, like, it, it was legit. I was playing. I was, we're playing on a good team at good players. Um, I broke my finger first game of the year. Uh, came back three games later. I had a concussion. Had no symptoms for about 18 months. Oh, and wow. that was it. So the game was, the game was taken away from me, but I'm healthy now. One, but two, I, I think every hockey player, um, needs a definitive like line yeah. because we all think we can still play. We all still have the dreams of the what ifs or like, and I was so lucky cause I got, I got the chop and there was no way that anything was going to change what happened. So there's no it's spilled milk. Like it's over. Yeah. And looking back, I'm so happy about that because um, I don't know if I would have been able to stop because right. you can make you can make enough money, yeah. you can play on good teams, you can have different experiences. But like, what are you really doing after a certain point? And for me, it was always about playing the NHL. That was the only for sure win championships, and I want to play in the NHL, and, and that wasn't going to happen. So. Yeah. so I was very lucky. Uh, my head got me out of the game. Head's great now. Good, but. Uh, it was a definitive, hey, it's time to move on and do something else with your life and stay in the game and just find out how you can contribute and help it. Yeah. No, it, it, yeah, because you're right. It kind of someone or someone else made the decision for you, right? It, it was an injury in your case, but it was basically, a, you know, if you go back, it's not going it, to, it's not going to be good. And it's, uh, yeah, no. you're right. It's yeah. kind of forced your hand a little bit, right? Did you find the transition? Yeah leaving the game to like, you know, call it normal life, but leaving the game into just, you know, being, in, you know, not Benny's the pro player that's, you know, signing autographs. Cause a lot of guys go through a hard time there where they miss that buzz of being around the boys. Obviously that's one thing that we all miss. And that's why we do stuff like this and still kind of, you know, keep in touch with our yeah. guys and stuff. But, um, 
Yeah, how was that transition for you? Was it hard kind of going from, you know, Benny's the pro player to just, you know, Benny's the guy? Yeah, somebody described it. I think it was Mike Stapleton. I, I coached his son at, at Culver. Mike's with the, the Ducks organization. Um, I think he grabbed me. He said, Benny, he's like, hockey players die two lives. Once when they hang up their skates, the next time when they go six feet in. And we kind of laughed about it, yeah. but like, I think he's right. Like I haven't for, I haven't, you know, lost that conversation or, um, that, that thought still rings true. Cause like there's a grieving period where like the one thing that you did for your whole life, the one thing that you got pretty good at and were recognized for that paid you pretty well, that gave you summers off, you know, you go down the list of <laughs> yeah, things yeah. like, like that's over now. And you have to like start at the bottom somewhere and you have to find purpose in your day. And, and it's, it, it was hard. Like there, there's a, I don't know if depression is the right word, but there's a real low where you have to pick yourself up and kind of reinvent who you are and how you act. And you're not going to be done at 1230 every day and have time to go yeah. have a two hour lunch and coffee. And like, <laughs> like, like there's certain things you get used to that aren't real world things and you have to redefine what normal is. And, um, yeah, there was a grieving period for sure. And, I've talked to buddies who have now, you know, we're moving on from the game and, and they're going through the same thing. Like it's just, it's, it becomes who you are and it's not a good or a bad thing, but when you do it that long, it does become who you are. Yeah. And now you have to like re reset that a little bit. And, um, yeah, again, you're just lucky to have good people around you and hopefully you have some other interests and, you yeah. know, your brains intact so you can be excited about the next, you know, whatever 30 working years of your life or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. So, uh, definitely a morning period though. And, uh, everyone I've talked to has had very similar experiences and, um, but you know, we're hockey players. We, <laughs> once we're down, we, we kind of wipe ourselves off. We get back up and it's like, all right, what am I doing now? You know, what's next? Yeah. And I think that's a good thing about us that we usually figure things out. And, um, yeah, and, and most guys do, which is good. No. And I think, like you said, you got some good friends and family around you that are going to help you because I think, you know, I know depression is like a tough label that, that, no one wants to put on anything, but I think everyone goes through it, especially I'm talking specifically on players being done playing. I remember when I was done playing, I had this house. So the hardest part for me was in September, October when, you know, guys are at camp and they're all showing up. Hey boys, what's going on? How's the summer? And then they get into training camp and you're battling in training camp together. And then you start the season. And that was the hardest part. And then once games go, you're like, Oh man, once the season kind of goes on, you kind of get used to it. Uh, that was the hardest for me. And I remember, I remember <clears throat> like kind of entering the real world, but I was doing private lessons in the morning at seven in the morning, you know, but I remember I had like four in a row for a couple of weeks and I do like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but I'd go to my private seven late. I would come home, grab a coffee on my way home, eat quick breakfast. So it'd be like eight 30 and I'd sleep on the couch for like an hour and two. And I remember waking up after about two weeks of doing this routine, which was like a back to college, terrible routine. But now I'm a grown man with a house and I'm like, I remember having this kind of not epiphany, but just like this realization. I'm like, I'm mildly like, I didn't tell anybody this. I'm telling like, you know what? I talked about it, but I'm like, I think I'm depressed a little bit. Like, I think I'm, you know, and, and it was my way of dealing with it. And I kind of snapped myself out of it. And maybe instead of doing that now, I go for a run or I go work out or I try to change my routine. Right. But, yeah. and I think yeah. the more guys like yourself talk about this, I think it's important because some of these young players maybe being done junior hockey are going to go through the same thing, but they're 17, 18 and that's hard. Right. And yeah. for guys like you or I that we're a little bit older, we could kind of figure it out and hopefully deal with it and be able to move on from it. But for some of the kids that are, you know, maybe got their careers cut short because of an injury or something like that, it is a tough period to go through of kind of that. Like you said, that I, th I think that's a great way of saying it. Almost that morning, like morning your, your hockey death a little bit that you're done playing and you're not going to see the boys every day going to the rink. And yeah, you're not going to have afternoons off. And, you know, um, so I think it is important to share stories like that because it, it it's common and everyone goes through it at some, some extent, you know, whether it's really severe or real, sure. real easy for some people. I think it's, uh, I think it's definitely something that is, uh, that is worth noting and talking about for all, you know, kind of all ages, especially as you get more competitive into junior and college and pro and stuff like that, for sure. Um, and then I guess hundred no, percent agree. Yeah. I guess the, the next part for you is now, now you're done playing. So, you know, you're kind of finished, you're figuring out what you're going to do. And how did you, you know, I obviously, I'm going to assume you were always going to try to stay in a hockey. You weren't looking at, at going to get a bank job. You're looking at, you know, trying to stay in the game, obviously. But uh, how did you kind yeah, of figure yeah. out getting into skill development and like, or, you know, or, or did you, or did you dabble in a couple other things and then figure out, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this. 
you know, it's just something, I mean, even when I was playing pro or in college, we'd, we'd go back and, again, you know, bringing up Shattuck again and we, they set aside ice for us every, you know, every day and our, our buddies would come back and they'd spend the summer with us and we'd, we'd play. And back then we used to, again, you know, sit around with other college NHL European guys and, you know, would you, would you see this here? What'd you learn? And we would just sit out there and we wouldn't even play half the time. We would just be working on tricks or like, Hey, did you see how this guy, you know, yeah. in the playoffs last night? And like, so we, we started that on our own just because it was fun and because we wanted to all get better and share what we learned. And, and we did that with our workouts. You know, we try, well, let's do this workout, you know, for this month. And then we'll, you know, we didn't know what we were doing, but, but it was kind of our own playground where we were all motivated. We wanted to be players and we were curious about everything. So I think it started there where we just, we always wanted to get better. And I realized that I'm only going to, you know, five eights kind of where I'm at. Um, you know, my body weight where I needed to be, I'll get into shape. Like there's only so many things you can really improve upon, but it seems like skill development and, you know, even just decision making. Um, those are areas we haven't quite touched yet. You know, like not that we haven't touched it, but like the rate of, the rate of return on these investments or the time that we spend could really separate me from somebody else. You know, we're not even getting into the mental training, which I think is another, yeah, you know, sure. area that's really underutilized in sports. But we always thought if we could come back and have a better skill level because we spent the time, everyone's going to be fast. Everyone's going to be strong. Everyone's going to be able to do it. But if I can make the play when it matters, you know, that's what's going to get me the next power play ice time. And that's going to yeah. get, you know, the game winning goal is going to get us to the championship, you know, whatever it is. But. Uh, we just always thought that that was the most important time we spent in the summer was our individual skill development. And so we used to just make things up and share. And again, I was around world-class people and, um, and we just all did it together. And so that's when it really started for us because we saw the value in it. That's awesome. And it's kind of honestly a little bit ahead of the curve because, you know, up until probably, well, in the last probably decade, there hasn't been a lot of like specific skill coaches and specific skill. You know what I mean? Like not a lot of private lessons. Like it, it, there has been, but I know I did the first one I ever, I instructed one, just a parent came up and said, Hey, would you work with my son? I'm like, yeah, sure. I had no idea what I was doing as far as like a plan, but you know, that was the first way I got introduced to it. And that was back in probably 06 or 07 when that's when I started doing really like skill, you know, skill based stuff and really working on skill. And it's evolved so much over the years. Um, and I agree with you. I think there's still the old school mentality where just like, if you want to get better at crossovers, you do the five circles after practice to the right, and then you do them to the left and then you're going to get better. I'm like, well, yeah, but I could, we could speed that up by, you know, by changing it a little bit and really teaching how to do it properly, you know? And so I think it's still a bit of a battle between the new school and the old school on, on skill development. But man, if you get around a good skill coach and you see it and I've seen it, it's amazing what you can do with some of these young players as far as teaching them how to, you know, whether it's shooting, passing, skating, giving them confidence, the mental part of the game, like you said, you know, giving them some, some mental tools to help them battle through different things that they're going through. Um, I think, you know, it, the, the whole getting in with a good skill coach or getting someone that's going to be in your corner, I think is huge. And, uh, and, and obviously you've seen a lot of fruits from that over the years, I'm sure with working with guys, you know, now that, now that you're retired. Yeah. And again, just to kind of even piggyback on what you said, I, I heard someone talk about it. it might've been Ron Johnson, a skill coach out in Western Canada. He, he said, we know what to do. Like, I, I want you to, you know, take a wrist shot from here or, or whatever. But often they don't know how to do it or, or when it should be done. And the how is the kind of step one where, like, you know, we have to actually teach them how to do this. Because I, I tell them, but they don't, they're not able to comprehend all these little things that go into how this skill is supposed to look. And then when are you going to use that thing? Because if, if you don't know when to use it, then I, I you know, you're going to be doing this at the wrong time or you're not going to set the defense enough to take advantage of this. And for me, it's fun because then you start going down in the layers of the game. But I guess for stage one, for me, it's like, all right, this is what to do, but this is how you're supposed to do this. Now let's work on the how and break it down. And uh, so it's been fun. Again, it's a, it's a process. It's, you just try to get a little better every day. It's, it's, you know, it's the same thing as a player. Like, I can just get a little better as a coach. And learn a couple more things or a better way to teach this and 
I'd move the needle a little bit. It's a, it's a good day, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, if we can just move that needle a little bit every day, I think we're doing all right. No, for sure. And I think, yeah, to your point, like I, I watch highlights, um, not so much right now, but when the game was on and I see stuff happen on a daily night and I'm like, oh man, that was a sick move or that was a really good, it could be simple stuff too. And then I'll try to break it down and look at it. And next time I'm on the ice, I'm going to try it. And then I'm going to teach the kids how to do it. I'll be like, hey, you got to try, you know, this is a great move to get the puck from behind the net to the front of the net or whatever. I just saw it last night, you know, we've all done it, but this is a really good way and a good position to do it or whatever. And so, yeah, you're constantly evolving how you teach, I think, and how you learn. And even if you think back two, three years ago, how you taught or how you saw a skill and how you see it now and how you teach it now, it's probably very different, right? Crazy. Yeah. Like, and that's the fun, like, this is all an evolution, you know, and you're looking not only to see where the game is going, but then you're looking at, you know, what is motor learning and skill acquisition? Like, like, how, like when you break this down, like, how does learning actually take place? And it's like, whoa, that's not what I, exactly what I thought three years ago. Like, like this has changed the way that I'm going to talk about this, the way I'm going to build it up. And, and again, I just think we're so lucky because the game is such a great game and you know, Connor McDavid, I mean, he's a tough example because he's just faster than everyone, but yeah. someone like, even like Panarin, if we're talking offense, like he can't keep his secrets to himself. Like he shares his secrets every time he goes on the ice yeah. and we get to look at it, break it down. And then like, Hey guys, this is what Panarin does. And like, he can't like, he can't have his cards right here. And it's like, how lucky are we? You know, yeah. uh, every night we get to see what these guys are doing, what they're thinking. And then we get to try to break that down. So a 12 year old, a 16 year old, uh, Nathan Gerby can, yeah. you know, start to utilize this in their own way. And I think that's pretty cool. You know, I think it's special. Oh, it's yeah, I totally agree. I think it's, I think it's awesome. And for those guys like a Panarin or a McDavid, they have like, don't be scared. No one's going to take your job. <laughs> you guys are fine. <laughs> you guys are, you guys do it at an exceptionally, you know, that's the other thing is as a skills coach, you might meet some skill coach along the way where they've got the secret sauce. They're like, ah, oh, you know, I, I, I know how to teach. Like, no, you don't. Like, you got a flavor on how you teach it. And maybe you're really good at doing it. Maybe you're the, one of the best guys at doing it. And that's amazing. But for a guy like Connor McDavid, there's only one guy that's going to be able to play like Connor McDavid. And that's Connor McDavid. Putting together his evasiveness and his skill and his speed and his handling. Like, same with Panera. There's only one guy that's going to be able to handle a puck like that in full speed and move laterally quick and see the ice the way he does. You know what? And everyone's a little bit different, obviously. So, for me, there's never any fear of like someone stealing my stuff. It's all out there. You, you know, you check it out and you watch how guys play. Like you said, they're, they're an open book on how they play. Now, if you can mimic it and you can teach it, man, all the power to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you can teach it, then like, that's great. Cause it is out there and, and, uh, it's fun, you know, especially you get a captive audience and kids want to get better. And if they're able to take some of that stuff and, you know, go places with it, like, what an awesome feeling that is, you know? Totally. No, for sure. Now let's talk about a, a little bit about what you're into now, like what you're doing now. So you're part of the I can kind of the IHS group, which is a, a, again, I mentioned at the start of the show, but a real good resource for any hockey coach or parent or even player that wants to kind of look in and dive in a little bit to skills, obviously, and breaking down skills and then all drills and practice plans and uh, little, you know, coach talks and things like that. Um, yeah, but chat a little bit about that as far as how you got into that and kind of what kind of piqued your interest when, when, when maybe they approached you or you were researching on them a little bit and how, to, how all that kind of came about. Well, I mean, it almost like circles back. Uh, one of the owners, uh, Neil Soderstrom, he, he's an old Shattuck buddy. He, uh, hockey player, cool. played hockey at UMaine. And again, you just reunions, you know, pick up games and. So we knew what he was doing, and I, we probably talked about it five or six years ago at uh, one of the hockey reunions. And uh, they, hey, I know you're coaching. It'd be great if we could get some content or even just, you know, a couple things here and there. And it's turned into a clinic every year, and we're trying to get it up to two clinics. But the idea is just to have really, really easy-to-use resources for, for coaches of all ages. And, and to be honest, in what they want to focus on a lot of is, is the, the youth coaches. Yeah. You know, the, the dad for the 10 U team who's coming in and, you know, he's got some nice players, but he's coming from a, you know, an eight hour job. And, um, just to give them again, not only the what, but the how and maybe the why we're, we're doing this or why this drill progression goes this way. And so again, I, I don't think if anything, I, I'm stealing stuff from past experiences and just, you know, conversations, but we put together the drills, you know, it's like, geez, I learned a lot of this when I was a kid in Finland because, this is the way they structure their practices. There's not a lot of straight lines. There's not a lot of rote memorization drills. Like we're trying to create scenarios and experiences and 
force these kids to make reads and decisions in tight spaces. And, and not only that, but do it in the simplest drill so that they don't have to learn the drill. They're actually getting like the experience that we want to set up for them. And so, so it's just been fun to have conversations with them over these last four or five years. And again, we're, we're all friends. We're all fans of the game. And um, it's fun that we continue to do it and try to find better ways to do it. And um, again, it's led to this conversation here, which is great. And, Again, I, I just think they're really, really good people who have a good mission of just trying to share the game, you know, as easily as possible. And and we just have a blast filming. We just have a great time uh, doing these little clinics. And again, all right, like what's next then? How can we teach this better? Where's where's this going here? And um, and again, so it forces me to stay on my toes because I can't show up with the same stuff. Or, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> like no, we already have that then. Like that. <laughs> Like that was two years ago. Like we need something. We need 2.0. Yeah. So again, this, this good buddies getting together uh, and just trying to push it forward a little bit. And again, I don't, I'm not even a member. I don't know what I am to be honest with you. I'm just a guy who gets to go out there and get on the ice and do some coaching and uh, yeah, just help them out. So I'm you know, awesome. proud to do that. No, it's great. I think the one thing too, there's tons of stuff on the internet. We all know that you can look up hockey drills right now and you'll find pages and pages and pages of it. The one thing I found when I started doing research years ago on just like how to, you know, I'm looking selfishly for myself on what else is out there, but there's not a one-stop place where you can find the skills that go with the drill, that go with how to teach it. You know what I mean? Like all that, because you can find drill here, but then what complements that drill? What are the skills in that drill? And then, okay, how do I do a second drill that's going to complement? And I think that's one thing that you guys have kind of nailed as far as you've got the instructional piece of it. The, the the hockey plan is there the, the the drills there and then you can set up a whole plan around that drill which i think is and like you said i think that is the number one thing make it as easy as possible for coaches because it is difficult when a coach is working an eight-hour day and dropping his daughter off at, at soccer and then running to the rink and he's got to run a practice for an hour and a half and has no idea what he's going to do you know so there's your scrimmage your j drill and maybe a shootout at the end right and that's your practice so yeah and <laughs> Again, I, I think it's, in, you know, just in talking with you, we have the same passion for the game where, like, you want to go into a rink, you know, at any age level. You want to see kids, like, one, having fun, but two, like, working on stuff, making decisions, and, and not just standing in line waiting for their turn. Like, it breaks your heart when you see it not done to a level that the kids deserve because they're they're not falling in love with the game. They're falling out of love with the game. And... I want them to have some of the joy that I had as a kid. And well, and again, whoever does it, you know, whoever is able to do that hats off. But I know that's definitely the mission for the IHS boys and uh, Chris, Scotty and Mills, you know, they, they've done so much work and I'm able to just come in and, and, you know, they just take care of me so we can just put some good stuff and get some nice content for these coaches and dads and moms and, and again, I just really like the purpose they have behind it. and It's, uh, it's fun. It's got to awesome. be fun. Oh, so that's great. That's why we continue to do it. Yeah, and it's all, it's fun to do it with buddies, obviously, but it's all, it's also cool when you have a couple like-minded people that are on the same page. You get some good discussion going back and forth, and I, I like that. Like That's one thing that I probably miss the most about playing you know, organized hockey with a bunch of the guys is having those conversations, whether it's talking about politics or the power play. It doesn't matter, right? It's always fun to get a little bit of steam going or, you know, have, have some, oh, it, right. Get the chirps up and like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just get jumping on guys. And no, it is the best. It's the absolute best. And we're all students of the game. We all love the game. And, uh, yeah, yeah. You just get the energy going. It's, it's tough to beat. Definitely. No, that's cool. And, uh, so right now, are you, are you involved like for yourself personally? I know we're not playing right now, but uh, up until, uh, you know, kind of the quarantine, I guess we can call it, but, uh, were you, were you, I know your dad's coaching, were you helping out a little bit? Were you involved kind of doing some skill development as far as kind of on a regular basis with them or, or any of the teams around? No, I wasn't. I, I tried to get up here to Cleveland as much as I could just, uh, you know, just watch games yeah. and, and just kind of see what the American league is like. I haven't seen it in a while. And, um, just to understand, I mean, even just the age of the players different than when I played. Sure, and, yeah, yeah. Um, just it, it's all changed, and yeah. uh, so that was fun just to watch. But no, I've not been doing any work with them. Um, again, it's been kind of a journey for seven or eight years since the game has ended. Is it, you know, is it coaching? Is it, you know, do I want to focus more on the development on the strength side or skill side? And to be honest, if I could combine the strength and the skill side, it's like, well, that that looks like player development to me. You know yeah. where we connect all these different things. And so 
Um, I've been able to do that a little bit at the Division One level at Miami University for a couple of years. Awesome. It's a blast. And, and uh, again, sometimes goals under the guise of strength coach. But then I get to go on the ice after we do that. And then we get to go and actually use this stuff and awesome. use your, you know, teach them not only to have a bigger bench press or whatever, but, hey, this is how you're going to maneuver in the corner and how you're going to create space for yourself, you know, using what we just, you know, built upon in the gym. And so um, I love the connection of the two worlds. I think that's fun. But at the end of the day, the ice is the most important thing and, and the, the skills and the techniques and uh, the how, when, and why are so important for these kids. And uh, so I hope I get to more, do more of that. That's my goal. And whether it's at the collegiate level or the pro level, I'm uh, – I'm excited for that next opportunity right now. That's awesome, man. No, it's so, I, I love it. And I think I, I'm on the same page with you. I think the off ice compliments the on ice. I, I know the old, the old line when we were young was, oh, you don't score goals in the gym, right? Well, okay. But it can help you maybe get around the ice a bit, right? Uh, so I think, yeah, 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 I think, you know, and, and the, the athlete that I know for me anyway, when I was younger, I mean, if you watch most of the guys, leg day was an option, right? Because uh, no one likes doing legs. So it was all like chest and bias. And, you know, you walk in and the, yeah. after, the, after the summer, guys are jacked. They got little, you know, little <laughs> little twigs for legs. But it's changed so much over the years, which is awesome. You know, you see guys that are just, they look like fit people, but they're crazy strong. They got usually big bums, big legs. And, you know, and, and I, I really, I agree. With you. I think that's a big, big, it's got to complement each other for sure. And I know when I finished, uh, you know, finished university, I, I had an exercise physiology degree and I wanted to be a strength coach. That's kind of was my goal is to be a strength coach. And I was fortunate when we came to London and started this business, we ended up a gym. Actually, Sam Gangi and Dave Gangi were in London for a while because Sam played here and Dave was coaching. And um, so they bought a gym here at the rink and they, 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 they kind of ran. It was just more of a place for Sam to work out and it was a small business for them. And, and a couple of years into it, they were around less and less and less because they were in the NHL and whatever. Right. So I, uh, approached the manager at the time and said hey do you think dave would sell this and they said uh he's like ah, probably like, we got we were doing some stuff with them and helping out some on ice stuff with them and and uh, i said maybe so two weeks later i had the keys to the gym i bought it off him and i only bought it because oh, i boy. thought he was going to get rid of it and i was like if i don't buy this someone else is going to come in and buy it and i'm going to get stuck with another competitor in here and, and i didn't have the money to buy yeah. it like yeah. so dave was great and he's obviously probably done pretty well for himself and he said well you can finance it through me so i basically you know he carried it for me and i just paid him off over the three four years it took right uh so then we ended up getting kind of i and i was very very fortunate but i kind of got the best of both worlds because i was doing some on ice and now i had a gym yeah now i didn't know what i was going to do with the gym because i'm like so i was doing both for a long time for a while and then we found an unreal strength coach and i realized kind of what you were saying is the value for what I do, I think, is more on the ice than it is in the gym. I love the gym and I love doing it and I could push kids and I can get them better. But this guy that I had, this strength coach who I still have, it was unbelievable. And I was like, you take the gym and I'll do the on ice. So that's kind of what we've done. And he runs the gym and, you know, he's yeah. my partner and he's unbelievable. And, and I do the on ice. And so I got very lucky. It just kind of fell in my lap a little bit or, you know, awesome. asked the right questions and it fell in my lap, I guess. But, um, but yeah, so it's kind of, it's kind of cool. But, um, yeah, it, it's so yeah, we're on the same page as far as just that mirror and, and we talk all the time, you know, kid on the ice's stride is short. I'll go talk to him and say, hey, listen, like I think he's you know, I, this is what I think. And he's like, Yeah, he's super tight here. Okay, perfect. And then he can work on that and hopefully over the time it'll that'll help that that player extend his stride or whatever it is, you know. So it is, Oh, uh, that's so funny cool. you guys are doing that. I love that. Those are great problems to solve and uh Yeah again, it's great to have a team around you to do that. So that's fantastic. Well, listen, buddy, I really appreciate your time and we're going to have to have you up and up, up to London at one point. So we, so you and I can nerd out face to face on skill development and working out and all that kind of stuff for sure. No, I, I'd enjoy that. I'll bring my books and my notes and totally. we'll sit around the, the table and just chat and be great. Yeah, no, definitely. We'll have to do that. But listen, I really appreciate this, man. This was awesome and a uh, great opportunity to chat with you and unbelievable story, obviously, as far as just, you know, doing what you did, playing a lot of pro, and then now giving back to the game and getting into the, the coaching. And I know you've dabbled in coaching and skill development, a bunch of different stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you're going to find a good pocket where you're going to, and maybe not, maybe you'll just be a, a guy who kind of dabbles in it all for a while and, and can give your knowledge back to the game. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. We'll see where the journey goes. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Yeah. No, that's awesome. awesome. Well, thanks a lot, buddy. We'll be in touch. Hey, thank you. All right. That extra gear, that first three steps, huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today. 